I'm going to give you, you know, a little bit about Cisco and a little bit about the landscape, and then we're going to dive right into what that connected supply chain looks like. I'm going to give you a few examples of it happening now inside of Cisco. I could I could probably spend the next six hours talking about all the things that are going on, but we'll just give you a little flavor. And then I'm going to talk about three of my favorite trends to watch that uh, that we think are pretty intriguing. A uh, little bit about Cisco itself and Cisco's supply chain. Uh, we are one of the worldwide leaders in IT. We've been around for a while. We were founded in 1984. We're headquartered in San Jose. I'm, uh, I'm actually based in Atlanta, Georgia, which means a lot of late night meetings. We have about uh, 70,000 plus employees. Lots and lots of channel partners. So one of the things that we do very well is we have a great stratified uh, channel approach to the marketplace. Some customers go direct. A lot of customers go through value-added resellers, distributors, etc., which is great, but it makes things a bit complex. Uh, the other thing that we'll get to in a second is our supply chain is largely outsourced. So we've got partners on the customer side. We've got partners on the supplier side all collaborating to build a, a great supply chain for our customers. Um, our solutions are very broad, a uh, large portfolio of lots of products, lots of solutions, lots of applications. You know, I'm not going to drain the slide. You guys can see all the stuff we do, and I'm sure that most of you know who Cisco is. But at the end of the day, if you're on the Internet, it's almost a sure thing that you're running through some of our gear somewhere in the world. So it's a very exciting company to work for, and I'm proud to work for Cisco. When you look at our uh, manufacturing footprint, uh, we have a global supply chain. We're in 12 countries. We've got about 37 locations. Uh, for those of you that are based in the U.S., I'm proud to say that we are a large U.S. manufacturer and have been for years. But we also have factories in, in the South, in Mexico. We have factories in Europe. We have factories in Asia. We have a relatively new factory in Brazil, uh, and uh, we, we build a lot of things. Uh, fundamentally, we ship about 250,000 average daily items, and uh, it's, it's daunting to be able to make a supply chain like that run effectively every single day. Um, sorry, guys, I keep hitting the right key instead of the left key. When we look at uh, strategic tech trends, this is from Gartner. I think that um, anybody who's been in a Best Buy in the last few months or years can recognize that when you go into a retailer like that and you used to see DVDs or uh, electronics for audio or televisions or something in the center of the store, and now what's taken over is a whole series of connected things right in the middle, right? So you see connected security systems, you see connected thermostats, you see uh, connected things to make your life at home easier. Even the appliances nowadays are connected. And you can almost not buy a receiver without a, a port or a television without a port. So the home is becoming more and more connected. And frankly, uh, the industries are becoming more and more connected as well. So, you know, it's not surprising that Gartner's saying, hey, the, the big theme for 2015 is digital business. Uh, all of these technologies that we're operating as islands are now starting to get plugged in together. And those, those plug-ins and connections and process connections are actually starting to disrupt traditional business models. Similar to the way the, the Internet started to disrupt, for instance, the music industry uh, with uh, digital downloads, et cetera, the content industry, we're now seeing many, many industries across the business architecture being disrupted by this new technology. So it's an exciting time. It's a bit of a scary time as well. And, you know, if you look at these predictions, 40% uh, of the Fortune 500 companies won't exist in 10 years. Pretty amazing, pretty scary. Let's see what that means in terms of connecting the supply chain. We, we actually like to think about a uh, maturity curve for the connected supply chain. So if you think about the ecosystem, the world that I grew up in a long time ago and actually even relatively recently 
was a world of totally unconnected manufacturing. In fact, while the machines may have generated data, it was really hard to get the data out. I remember some of our engineers walking around with little three and a half inch floppy disks trying to get data out of a machine and put it into a spreadsheet. That world is not substantially different from those days to now. Yes, you can get it. Yes, it may be on an Ethernet port, but it's not connected to the other machines in the ecosystem. And what you'll see is perhaps not a preponderance, but a large number of factories still operate the same way. So the first step in the maturity curve is starting to connect that factory, starting to get data out of the pick-and-place machines, the robots, the stamping machines, etc., that can feed process control information into a central data and analytics platform that can tell you what's going on inside the four walls of your factory. That in and of itself is pretty exciting, but now you start to connect those nodes, right? So you're not just connecting factories anymore, you're connecting factories to warehouses, to transport networks, to other warehouses, and you're sensing where the inventory is, and you're sensing the process changes, et cetera. That's the next step in the maturity curve, that connected supply chain. And the last step is where you're really starting to connect not just your own echelons of your own supply chain, but you're starting to connect your supply chain to your component supplier's supply chain. That's really the promise of the connected ecosystem all the way end to end, from beginning to end, from component supplier all the way to the customer. Cisco as a company has been connecting customers with our supply chain for, for many years. We actually have pallets arrive at customer sites with a single barcode that they scan that brings in not only all of the serial numbers, but all of the enablement data, the MAC addresses, the, the process data, and connects it right to their billing system when they do that scan. We've been doing that with certain customer segments, and our goal is to bring that across the entire ecosystem. Right, So that's where we are in terms of the connected ecosystem. It depends on which element of our supply chain. There are, there are areas that are still unconnected manufacturing, and there are businesses and areas that are all the way to connected ecosystem. Our aspiration is to get to connected ecosystem across the entire Cisco supply chain. If you look at a day in the life of a supply chain manager, and my guess would be if you're on this uh, webinar, you've probably lived this day in the life many, many times. When something goes wrong or when something happens, sometimes even when things go right but go a little bit more quickly right than you expected them to, you have to react. And sometimes that reaction is is in the middle of what, what I'd like to call the fog of war. It's hard to figure out what's going on on the front lines. You don't know where stuff is. Things are either moving slower or moving faster or moving more difficult than they were before. And that spurs lots of phone calls, email, sneaker net, people running around, escalations, SVPs trying to get a hold of you, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the underlying processes, remember I've said I've been doing this a long time. In a lot of ways, even though we're operating off laptops or PCs or something like that, it's not materially different than the days of paper processes, VDTs, a little green or amber display tubes. I'm showing my age now. Uh, and, and frankly, it's faster and it's better but it's not way different than it was in the 70s or 80s, right? Uh, we've just gotten faster at automating those processes. And all of our vendors throughout the ecosystem have their own proprietary solutions, their own walled gardens that really don't talk very well to one another. And so we're forced to the expedience of using standard B2B messages with you know, service level agreements that are service levels in the minutes rather than in the nanoseconds, et cetera. So imagine if you're standing, for instance, at a checkout counter trying to process a payment with your credit card, and you get the same service that you would get in an EDI message or a RosettaNet message, probably you wouldn't be a very happy customer, but that's the way the supply chain runs. And in a lot of cases, it runs on islands of automation. What, uh, what we believe that means is that all of us in the supply chain run the risk 
of being disrupted by an internet for supply chain startup. So, you know, my statement is we all better get moving and we all better react to internet speed because that's what's going to be demanded. It's what's being demanded of the businesses today. When we talk about what Cisco's doing about that, uh, Cisco's supply chain, uh, John Kern, who leads our supply chain, is really a very bold and agile leader, and he's looked at making big bets in supply chain. So we're looking at really a five-fold big bet. The Internet of Things, data analytics, cloud, social and collaboration technologies, and tied in with mobility. And what that does for us is it brings us into this platform that we call the Internet of Everything, not just the Internet of Things. And I'll tell you what that looks like for us. Uh, Michael talked about it a bit, but when we talk about the Internet of Things, things by themselves, if you look at that lower right, that's not so valuable, right? You've got things, and they're talking to a network, and they're connected, and that's great, but without the other pieces, the pieces of what we call the Internet of Everything, the value is not nearly as rich as it is once you connect it to people, data, and process, right? So you've got your things feeding data into the network, but now you're connecting the people to what those things are doing. You're getting data out of the things, and the data is telling you very interesting information that you can actually use to try and decide things. I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. And that's tied into process and process automation. We actually believe at Cisco that we want to get the computer to do all the things the computer can do and leave the human element for the things that only people can do. So we want to automate as much of that routine work as we possibly can and feed the exceptions to people for action and decisions. How that manifests itself is we talked about that maturity curve. We actually believe that within a node, a factory, or a warehouse, you've got one-site systems only and connectivity, even though it – for those of you guys who are actually working in factories trying to connect a factory, you can say, wow, easy to say that it's easy, but it's really not easy at all. Yes, but it's the easiest of all these, right? Connecting a factory and connecting a machine inside a factory is fairly straightforward, and all you need to do is be able to ship data back and forth. You start to move between those nodes in your own supply chain. So you want to move between you and, for instance, your outsourced manufacturing partner or your outsourced logistics partner. Now not only do you have to have the data, but you're dealing with two enterprises, two sets of systems, sometimes many sets of systems. You can accomplish it with that messaging that I talked about, but now you need to start looking at platforms, right? Because you've got to have a platform that will allow you to – to, in a similar fashion, be able to talk back and forth between those enterprises. As you move up that supply chain connection value chain, and you're trying to get connections across the supply chain, so not only between you and your manufacturing partners, but upstream to your component partners, now you're getting to a point where maybe even messages aren't enough, and you need to be talking about protocols as you do it. And and frankly, what we're finding is that messaging starts to become not fast enough to be able to take action, quick action. We actually need to be looking at protocols, and in fact, we're working on that. As you move all the way to the end and you're starting to now connect not just your suppliers but your customers, you not only have to have protocols, you have to have standards, and you have to have a whole series of things that make this work together seamlessly. So remember I talked about our customers that can take, for instance, our our uh, certain types of consumer premise equipment, read the handling unit barcode, and read in all the data. To be able to integrate that between Cisco systems and a customer's billing systems, you actually have some have to have some fairly detailed sets of standards that will allow that to work properly. So the the message on this slide is while you go further and further out in the supply chain, it gets more and more complex, but you go further and further out and there's more and more value at connecting that information. I'll show you 
kind of what our supply chain looks like right now. So this is a it's kind of a fairly straightforward picture of Cisco's supply chain. You have Cisco at the top talking to suppliers and our ODM original design manufacturer or joint design manufacturing companies our contract manufacturers feeding our logistics centers, which may feed transport carriers, which may feed customers. And over the last couple of years, what we've been able to do is we've actually been able to start to connect those contract manufacturers and those logistics centers. And beyond that, We've now adopted this uh, platform called Supply Chain Collaboration, and that starts to become an end-to-end -end platform that connects suppliers through contract manufacturers through those logistics centers. So, so SCP, Supply Chain Collaboration Platform, is an inventory and material movement management system that allows us to have full visibility end-to-end -end of where the inventory is, where it's moving to, where it's coming from, and manage those cases. What we're doing now is we are connecting all of that with our Oracle Transportation Management System, which will allow us to not only manage that inventory, but manage the movement of that inventory. So we're connecting factories and logistics centers. We're connecting that all the way into suppliers with SCP. We're connecting that all the way to customers with OTM, and we're feeding the data back and forth for use uh, our use. If we microcosm that back down to the warehouse, our vision for the warehouse is, if you look at what it used to be, remember I talked about how the the processes are not much different than they were in the 80s. Slow, when you, when you have an outsourced supply chain as we do, it's separated by companies. That whole receive, put up, pick, ship, cycle is essentially a batch cycle. So you wait until you've got a certain amount of goods, you run a pick list, the pick list tells your guys to go do certain elements of work. That's really kind of a batch process, not event-based. Uh, it's human-driven, it's desktop-based. When something arrives, you have to go through a series of things to decide what to do with it. And we think it's what we've always been. It's commoditized and it's very internally focused. We want to go to a system that is fast that is connected completely, that's a near real-time enterprise. And I say near real-time because we find that getting to that real real-time is very expensive, whereas near, near real-time usually meets our needs. We want to move from human-driven to largely machine-to-machine -to, -machine, to intelligent agents. And by intelligent agents, I don't mean people sitting in a call center. I mean programs that look for events and try and take action, take action in a business process automation standpoint behind the scenes and only feed those exceptions to humans like I talked about. It's an event management-based world. So instead of waiting for something to happen and then figuring out how to react, you actually have events that are already driven to certain types of reactions. We're moving to mobile event management. My belief is that if I can run my life on a cell phone or a smartphone, I should be able to run a warehouse on a smartphone. When that package comes in, and we'll get to this in a second, we want the package to know where it needs to go. We want to move from what we've always been to what we could be. We want to become differentiated in the warehouse space, and we want to become very, very customer-focused. So it's an exciting world. Let's take a click down and see what that world looks like. If you think about your factory and the connected use cases, when we look at the, the data analytics, the process control, et cetera, we actually find that the machines are now talking to us and telling us things like, what was my insertion force on a dim socket? And, oh, by the way, does that insertion force define that things went well with that insertion or not so well? Uh, we also can use that to drive TPM, preventative maintenance, machine-to-machine -machine data, et cetera. When you walk upstream, if you walk through our factories, if you're ever privileged enough to walk through our factories, you'll see that we have displays on the line that show the operators what to do in a very precise fashion. We're now wanting to connect those displays for key expedites so that 
not only can you see how to build something, but you can see that that's a hot order going to customer X, right? We want to be able to see uh, the, the assembly displays, the quality alerts, et cetera, all on that display. We also want to take that data and move it to the mobile device. So as the engineer is walking by the line, he or she can see what's going on on the line, and they have instantaneous visibility as process alerts, process monitors, order visibility, key expedites, quality. That should all be visible on your mobile device. Video, I'm going to talk about pervasive video in a little bit, but we're using video for all kinds of stuff, including process monitoring, TPM again, security, etc. Still using uh, barcoding, but we're also looking at RFID, brand protection, traceability. All that data is acquired, and it's put into the, the data structures that go into the product as it goes into the box, right? As the product goes into the box, remember our, our supply chain day in the life, let's say that you got one of those expedite escalation uh, calls. We want to be able to feed the data to that individual that needs to know about it as that pack out is occurring, right? And, and the expedite pre-alerts, we want to be able to feed that to the the warehouse upstream. So that's where that data transfer step comes in. We want to be able to send all that data to the warehouse management system before it's ever registered. And for those of you guys who know how WMS is run, I mean, in general, current WMS, generally need to know that the product is there before they can do anything in the world that we're working on and that we've already done a lot of work to make this happen. Uh, that WM knows before the product ever gets there what's going on with that key expedite, right? So it can be prepared to react. So that that expedite arrives at the back dock and what, what should happen and what is happening now is that the minute you scan it, you don't go through the receive, put up, pick list, pick ship cycle, the system knows, oh, this is that hot box that we've been waiting for because it's been pre-alerted from the previous node. We want to take that right to the shipping dock. Many of the other elements are the same. Warehouses in many ways are a lot like factories, but we're trying to make it all uh, very live. As you know, you know, RF guns have been around for a long time for barcode scanning, but we're tying all that into the process data. We've got the same digital signage. We've got the same mobility. We've got the same video, and we can alert the customer in the same way we're alerting ourselves. So, you know, so that's what the warehouse of the future tends to look like. Everything connected and everything agile and understanding every step. We've actually turned those concepts into real live architecture, and we're putting that architecture into our warehouses. I have a great innovation lab that's going in with one of my, my partners in uh, Houston, and we're testing out a lot of some of the more sexy concepts that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and it's it's really exciting. So even a year ago, we really couldn't have imagined the reality that is on the ground now and that we're turning into uh, into business process, and it's really exciting. Let me, uh, let me give you probably three flavors of some things that are going on. So the first thing is that supplier collaboration platform that I talked about. Fundamentally, that platform tracks inventory moves across the global network. We are using this today as a single platform. Lots of metrics, lots of governments, process governance, process automations, exceptions, shared data. We have connected that supply chain through a collaboration platform. In some ways, it's almost like a Facebook for a supply chain. And we're now able to proactively ID supply and demand imbalances, take action, and run it through this entire platform. So very exciting. Another uh, super exciting thing, and that I'm really proud to talk about, is this whole energy management thing, which we believe is going to save us millions of kilowatt hours every single year, right? And what we've been able to do is take a factory as a pilot and connect many of their machines, many of their chambers, high energy consuming devices, et cetera, to this sensing network that feeds data into a business analytics network. And it allows us to take action automatically and power down certain things when they're not being used, slow down, highlight things for the, the engineers to take a look at. We're reducing energy use. We're lowering our carbon footprint. We know exactly what our power usage and greenhouse gas uh, output is. 
And this stuff really works. And not only does it really work, but it really, really pays for itself. And so we're looking at a plan right now. In fact, I'm I'm right in the middle of helping to develop a plan to roll out this this brand new energy management stuff across our entire factory footprint. And we hope to roll it out across our entire warehouse footprint. That connectivity and that data analytics and those intelligent agents actually also serve other uses in that we can use that data anywhere. It doesn't have to be just restricted to energy. It can be tied to a host of other things. That's the promise of the Internet of Everything. If you want to talk a bit about the the social aspects, you know, factories are factories are important things. They're like they're like living beings and they're composed of living beings and those living beings have have feelings and thoughts and interests and connections to their supervisor, connections to their management chain, et cetera. So we've actually piloted and we're looking at rolling out across our network a mobile-based worker sentiment tool that allows us to sense what's going on with our employees, be much more attuned to the employees, much more socially responsible, and get real-time, real-life feedback on what those people are feeling if they choose to share their their data with us. So the, the factory workers can anonymously answer pushed out key questions about management, about their treatment, about compliance. We can get real-time status via their mobile devices, and we can analyze that data. So we're not only um, doing things that pay off, we're actually putting our technology and our money where our mouth is in terms of trying to be socially responsible and trying to sense what's going on in our factory environment. So it's just a pilot, but we're really excited about it, and the data that that's come back so far looks really interesting. And again, when we talk about the Internet of Everything, It's not just connecting things, it's connecting people to things and connecting people, frankly, to each other. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about trends. This is my favorite, uh, my favorite part. And as a lead into this, so this, this, uh, this robot on the cover, we've been spending a lot of time with robotics because my wife and I actually coach two robotics teams. One is a group of six to nine year olds. And one is a group of uh, 10 to 14-year-olds. And so as a consequence, uh, somebody like myself has learned a lot about robots, a lot more than I probably thought I would ever learn. And and it's really fun and it's really exciting. If you get a chance to, to do one of these, I would recommend it because watching these kids learn this stuff, it's uh, – it's it's hard to believe how advanced they are at even a very young age. Um, if you look at this particular robot, his name is Baxter. Uh, Baxter is what's called a collaborative robot. And what that means is that you don't have to program Baxter. You can teach Baxter by moving his arms to a particular location and actually running the process that you want him to run repetitively you can you can teach him how to do that and then he will remember so the programming may involve nothing more than manipulating his arms and his grippers to be able to accomplish a certain element of work and when you look at both the programming time and the price point i think Baxter these days runs about 22,000 US dollars robotics becomes much more uh much more accessible to almost anybody in the ecosystem so in the days when a robot was 50 to 100,000 dollars and the program it was two two or three times as much you know not so accessible nowadays much much more accessible and remember those robotics teams that I talked about you know fundamentally our best robotics uh engineer on our youngest team is a 7 year old girl so when your best source code programmer is a seven-year-old girl, you know that the robot future is very, very near. These kids are growing up. They're going to know so much about this space. It's going to proliferate all over the ecosystem. And if you're not thinking about it, you should definitely take a look and start thinking about it. Um, another thing that we're playing with at Cisco and playing with quite a lot is very exciting is the idea of augmented reality. So it's not – Virtual reality, where you have glasses that are black and shut out the entire outside world, it's augmented reality where your glasses can 
paint a certain color on a certain item as you look across the world or show you a heads-up display of where to pick product from or scan and snap a barcode simply by looking at it or tell you where to uh, where to put your product, et cetera, et cetera. Augmented reality looks very exciting. We have pilots being run by some of our logistics partners that are that are showing potentially 20 to 30 percent productivity increases in the picking operation, with concomitant increases in accuracy, et cetera. Very, very exciting for us, and these are going to be one of the first things that we put in our innovation lab. We actually see the future as a a not just augmented reality, but connecting a lot of wearable technology to it. So not only do you have the vision pick and the camera barcode scan, the same way you can snap a barcode with your cell phone and, and the system can read that barcode, augmented reality will be able to do the same thing. You look at the barcode and snap the barcode and it, it will read the barcode for you. But you we're coupling that older technology of voice picking with uh, talk back and transcribe with operator talk back. And in fact, one of the things that we've learned through our partners with the pilots is there's a big benefit to operators being able to actually talk back to other operators or talk back to their supervisors. And some of the highest reviews, new technology adoption is difficult. Some of the highest reviews we've gotten have been because of that capability that, hey, now I can talk to my boss at a moment's notice from from the line, and oh, by the way, he or she can see exactly what I'm looking at, less confusion for them, less confusion for me. The, the adoption curve is actually pretty good and it's pretty exciting. We can also use the same technology for telematics to map, and, and some of the guys in Cisco Consulting have done this. I've seen it to be able to map where the hot spots in the warehouse are, where are those forklifts going that that perhaps we can better optimize the pick layout so that we can distribute the work a little bit better and or cut the travel time. We can see that now with telematics and these wearables. The other thing that we believe we'll be able to do is body stress, safety monitoring. Obviously, there's privacy concerns that need to be worked out, but we actually think that we can mask a lot of the privacy issues and yet at the same time give our operators a more safe environment so we can sense when they've had a problem or when they're getting ready to get into a problem. Um, if you look at um, pervasive video, which is my third trend, we're actually trying to use video as a platform, not just as a point solution. So I talked about islands of automation, and I talked about, um, you know, connecting things. We actually believe that if you think of video not as a one-off for every single time, but you think of it as a platform that you can use in multiple ways across the entire ecosystem, both factory and warehouse, we know we can use video for maintenance alerts on our machines to say, hey, this machine is walking out of tolerance. We know that we can use video for process control. We actually have seen demonstrated video bins that will do auto replenishment. So the bin, with the price of a video camera at 30 bucks or less, uh, you can actually set up your bins to say, hey, I'm down to the last layer in the bin of parts. Now I can count the parts. Now I'm down to replenishment. Fire a transaction at the warehouse management system without a human being ever having to do anything. The computer and the video do it automatically. So we're looking at that. Security, such a big issue, especially for our international customers, uh, secure supply chain, chain of possession, damage alerts, loss prevention. When you look at video, that pervasive solution, and remember, you can snap a barcode that way as well. So in a lot of cases, capturing weights and dims and capturing barcodes becomes the enabler for all these other things that you can use video as a platform for. That technology gets super, super, super exciting. And oh, by the way, you can look at each other's face and talk to each other via telepresence. So so this is the last trend that we're looking at, and uh, this is probably my favorite because I, I, I think that that whole use of video across the entire factory warehouse network is going to be so huge in the next 10 years that, you know, you guys, it, it'll be like the – 
the migration of video into cell phones, it'll be everywhere. It'll be pervasive. So uh, in closing, I guess I'd like to say that Cisco's supply chain, under the leadership of our uh, myself and our supply chain leaders, uh, particularly John Kern, uh, we want to lead the way. We want to be the first in the industry to be able to roll up breakthrough productivity, and we're doing that now to be able to create faster, more proactive decisions, to increase customer satisfaction, to give real-time visibility. We want to connect everything, and, and we've got the data to be able to say that we can do it, and we're moving forward with it. So it's an exciting world, you guys. I mean, we – we uh, to me, this Internet of Everything world is a lot like the Internet in the – you know, the early days of Mosaic and all that where it looked like a cool thing. A lot of people are still not sure whether it's a trend. And then suddenly it overwhelmed the world like a, a giant wave over the entire world that dramatically changed the way we do everything. We believe that the whole IOE, the Internet of Everything world, is going to be exactly like that. And I am thrilled to be a huge part of it and thrilled to be a part of uh, of watching the industry grow up in this place. So, in conclusion, I'd like to say thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you got some value of it. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys today. So 